a report on the campaign to eradicate Anopheline mosquitoes in Sardinia. In June 1946, an entomological team, Dr. Aitken, an American, and Dr. Cassini, an Italian, flew into Sardinia. They were the advance guard of an organization known as ERLAS, set up to free the island of the malaria-bearing mosquito. They found most of Sardinia's 10,000 square miles to be mountainous, mountains that once were famous for their forests. Today, few trees remain. Most of them have been cut for charcoal. There is not enough vegetation to hold the moisture in the soil. As the water table falls, the soil slips down the hillside. Every winter the rains wash away more of the valley's richness. And everywhere in the uplands no less than on the marshy coast, all water is a potential source of malaria, which has been a scourge in the island for centuries. The Saads, there are 1,200,000, are mostly peasants. By tradition, they live in towns and villages and avoid making their homes in the open country. Far better travel each day over the worst of roads to their holdings and back. That is the social pattern of centuries of foreign invasion and domestic banditry. The upland plots they cultivate constantly grow poorer because sickness and poverty lead to bad farming, and in its turn, bad farming brings poverty and sickness. In the alluvial plains, where the land is more fertile, malaria has forced peasants to abandon their holdings. Every family lives in fear that its breadwinner will be stricken down with malaria. The disease has been endemic for centuries, and a survey in 1947 showed that 21% of the children inspected between 2 and 12 years of age had enlarged spleens. In one village, the figure was 80%. The entomologists came to make a survey of the various species of mosquito. They were principally concerned with Anopheles labranchi of the Macula penis group. Of the three main species in Sardinia, this is the only one known to transmit malaria. It breeds usually in open water, but it is often found in marshes and mountain streams. Anopheles algeriensis finds its favorite breeding grounds in marshes. Anopheles clabiger prefers upland streams. It likes shade, and its larvae are sometimes found in half-hidden springs or in charming pools like this. But more often it breeds under vicious undergrowth and is much more difficult to find. Algeriensis and clavager are not considered to be vectors for malaria under normal Sardinian conditions but it was found impossible to make sharp distinctions between the breeding places of Labranchi, Algeriensis and Clavature. The entomologists had only time to make a limited survey. Their findings necessarily could not be complete. Every evening they checked their specimens in the hotel bedroom. The harmless culicine larvae can be distinguished from the anopheline larvae by eye but a microscope is needed to distinguish some species of anopheles from others. Every breeding place discovered was recorded on a map. On the basis of this survey, the campaign was planned. How did the Sardinian campaign differ from those undertaken before? Ever since Grassi in Italy and Ross in India had proved in 1898 that certain mosquitoes carried malaria, vector species infecting man have been under attack in most of the malarious regions of the world. In Brazil, following the heavy epidemic in 1937, the vector, Anopheles gambii, was eradicated by the oiling of water surfaces and the dusting of breeding places with Paris green. Later, Anopheles gambii was eradicated from the Nile Valley in the same way. In both cases, gambii was a very recent invader. 
and some malariologists thought that it was the unfamiliar environment that made eradication possible. In Sardinia, during the war, control measures had broken down. In 1946, Anna proposed to attempt eradication rather than control using the insecticide DDT. Could this new insecticide eradicate from an area of some thousands of square miles anopheles that were not invaders but indigenous? This was the question before the directors of Erlas. Anopheles labranchi, the malarial vector, is easier to attack than Algeriensis or Claviger because unlike them, it is vulnerable not only as a larva, but also as an adult. In winter, Labranchi exist only as adult females, most of which shelter in man-made structures where they can be killed with DDT residual spray. In summer, the breeding places of all three varieties are accessible to larva siding with DDT oil solution, or can be destroyed by draining their breeding places. To start the work, one and a quarter million pounds were allocated from the UNRWA Lira Fund. Vast quantities of UNRWA supplies were delivered to the port of Cagliari. In November 1946, an experimental campaign was begun. Throughout the island, the interiors of structures were sprayed with this type of shoulder pump to kill adult Labranchi. This also gave the inhabitants immediate protection. In the following summer, in the area of Pula, Santadi and Sant'Antiocco in the southwest corner, all water surfaces were sprayed to kill larvae. Ninety percent of larva siding was done with this cheap and portable type of hand pump. But where that would not reach, the shoulder pump had to be used. Erlas is a word made up of the Italian initials of the title Regional Body for the Fight Against Anopheles in Sardinia. The head of the organization was the superintendent, Dr. John Logan, appointed from the staff of the Rockefeller Foundation. Under him came an organization which can be divided into three main services. The entomological service, administration, the spraying service itself. The entomological service was headed by the entomologist responsible for the original survey. In the winter, this service was used to control the house spraying campaign against adults. Later, during the anti-larvae campaign, it split into a large force of larva scouts and a small force of laboratory workers checking the findings of the scouts. Its main purpose was to act as a field intelligence service. Representative committees of leading men in each village were set up to decide who should be employed by Erlas. For example, scouts and chief scouts were chosen from among lawyers, engineers, clerks, mechanics, hotel keepers, students and the like. These men were no entomologists so full ecological surveys were out of the question. All the same, within a few weeks, they thought and talked about mosquitoes as if anopheline eradication had been their lifetime's work. They were taught to distinguish between anopheles and culicines, and to recognize the different types of breeding places. More than a thousand of these scouts were trained both in theory and practice. The other main section of the organization was the spraying service. In the first phase, the sprayers concentrated on the residual house spray against adult Labranchi. In the second phase, they were expanded to spray all possible breeding places. In November 1947, the first phase of the all-out campaign opened. Structures where the malarial vector Anopheles labranchi might rest 
were sprayed with 5% DDT in an oil and water emulsion. The people, though skeptical if malaria could be eradicated, welcomed the spraying because it killed flies, bugs and other pests. If the sprayers missed the house, they were very soon called back. The DDT was sprayed at a rate calculated to leave two grams per square meter of wall or roof surface. Outhouses containing animals were favorite shelters for Labranchi. When a house and its sheds had been treated, the spray team pinned a card just inside the front door to be marked in later checks for adult Labranchi. On the outside of the house was stenciled a DDT sign giving the date of the spraying. Very high buildings like this church were fogged out with an aerosol machine. This was used for immediate rather than residual effect since such large coal buildings were unlikely to be reinvaded in the winter. To check the amount of the DDT residue, a special test was developed by the Italian woman chemist, Professor Alessandrini. This was a distinct advance over previous tests. It determined within a few parts per thousand the quantity remaining on any surface. The color of the solution was compared with a standard color chart. Every conceivable type of shelter was sprayed, including the undersides of drains and bridges. Even these ancient monuments of the proto sards were sprayed. Female anopheles had been discovered in them in the depth of winter. Meanwhile, the entomological service was converted and expanded into a scouting organization to report the progress of the campaign. The plan was for scouts first to search the shelter using lights to detect the adults and sucking tubes to catch them. If they found nothing that way, they unfurled the umbrella, as it was called, and used a pyrethrum spray to knock down any adults that might be hiding. To spray houses against adult Labranchi required a relatively simple organization. Spraying teams went from town to town, village to village. The effectiveness of their work was checked by the independent scouting service. The spraying against adults was completed before the end of February 1948. The island was split into four regions for the anti-larval campaign. Each region was split into divisions, each division into sections, 
each section into districts. The district was the smallest administrative area. Because there are large areas of Sardinia without inhabited centers, it was often impossible to base a district on a town or village. In such cases, special camps had to be set up so that there could always be lava ciders within walking distance of their work. Sometimes a disc was used to represent a reasonable walking distance, and if possible, a town or village was located within its circumference. When the limits had been defined in the map room, they had to be agreed between district chiefs. Otherwise, possible breeding places on a boundary, like this well, might be overlooked. All district chiefs were therefore required to check the boundaries with their colleagues in adjoining districts. A district chief was responsible for seeing that every bit of water in his territory was sprayed by lava ciders under his direction. In Cagliari, a mixing plant had been improvised from odd pumps and tank wagons in which DDT was mixed with diesel oil. This mixture was dispatched to the regions and thence to the district centers where it was supplied to the lava ciders. The important thing about lava ciders was that they should be men who knew their district well. The work was simple, they could be trained in a few days. The hand pump could be taken into most places. Every known breeding place was numbered, and as long as the lava cider could recognize numbers, it didn't matter whether he could read or write. Each lava cider carried with him three liters of DDT solution, enough for a day. The day's work was laid out on a map. It was called a subsector. Six of these subsectors made up one sector, a week's work. Each lava cider was held responsible for spraying every bit of water in his sector every week. If his sector proved too large, readjustments were made. The main thing was to prevent any breeding place being neglected. To make sure that the larvae were being killed, scouts followed the lava ciders. They made several dips in each breeding place to find where the larvae were surviving. There were many hundreds of thousands of breeding places which had to be examined. The number of dips made sometimes ran into millions in a month. The scouts were required only to distinguish anopheline larvae from culocyne. Species identification of anopheles cannot be done in the field, so any anopheline larvae found are placed in a specimen tube containing formalin and sent to the entomological laboratory for species identification. The regional laboratories were working full time checking these specimens. Wherever anopheline larvae were found by a scout, he immediately served notice on the chief of the district to have the breeding place lava sided at once. The lava cider responsible for the lapse was taken to task. For inaccessible breeding places such as wells, a special DDT bomb was invented. was soaked in DDT solution, which gradually diffused over the water surface. Since it was 
it impossible to distinguish between the breeding places of the three main species of Anopheles, all breeding places on the island were considered potential sources of Labranchi. It was found, therefore, that anti-larval measures directed primarily against Labranchi were greatly reducing the total Anopheles population. Attacks on Labranchi, Algeriensis breeding places in the vegetation at River Mau and in overgrown marshes near the coast presented many problems. In some places, it was extremely difficult for the larviciders to reach the larvae. Other places were completely inaccessible. Certain such areas were marked out as suitable for spraying with aerosol. Venturi were fitted to the exhaust pipes, and the exhaust gases were used to form the aerosol. But here and there, larvae survived even after many treatments. The aerosol had failed to penetrate the thickest reeds. Aircraft were sent back again and again. Some fishermen with rights in these waters complained that fish were killed. Investigations are being undertaken to determine the facts. Reeds along the margins of some large areas of water were sprayed with shoulder pumps from boats. Aerial lava siding alone was found to be insufficient. For either aerial or hand-applied lava side to reach all parts of the water, vegetation had to be cleared. Large numbers of men had to be found and engaged. This was not difficult because large numbers at the time were out of work. In some places, the long-handled shoulder pump was employed as a flamethrower. Where the reeds were dry, it was useful for clearing them in front of ditching squads. Ditching was always used, but it was possible to dry up and so eliminate breeding places. It presently became clear that ditching and clearing were necessary adjuncts to lava siding. These operations had to be increased and even became a strain on the island's manpower. To speed up ditching, dynamite was used. Charges of 50% ditching dynamite were laid about 18 inches apart. A self-propagating explosion was provoked. These methods cleared Algeriensis along with Labranchi, the vector species, from much of the lowland. In the upland and mountain streams, Clavager alone, or associated with Labranchi, predominate. Often overgrown and choked with sharp brambles, these breeding places were exceptionally difficult to attack.
problems facing the lava siders came up over and over again in the section chief's council meetings. Regional directors often attended these meetings. The torn shirt became a symbol of the difficulties of clearing the brambles from hundreds of miles of mountain streams. Regional directors took such matters up at the superintendent monthly council. The enormous scale of every aspect of the work compelled Erlass in July 1948 to lengthen the period of the campaign and to apply for a further million and three-quarter pounds from the Italian government ECA fund. It was necessary to make a rapid increase in the labour force. In many districts, there were not enough men. Others had to be brought in from outside. The Erlass forces mounted to a peak of 32,000 in the second week in September. Three quarters of this labour force was engaged on clearing and drainage operations. To clear a mountain stream, bramble and tree cutters first passed down its course. Then came others who cleared out the bed of the stream. A rapid flow of water discouraged the growth of larvae. When the vegetation had been cleared, the lava cider could get to work effectively. Some clavager breed in tiny pools hidden under bushes, which had to be treated one at a time. There were also breeding places in potholes high up in the mountain. Local mountaineers were enlisted to deal with them. Here the scout and the lava cider were combined in one. Often at the end of the day the scouts were far from home and had to camp out. Towards the end of the breeding season, when larvae became hard to find, flying squads of scouts were organised. They were sent out raiding across sectional and regional borders to make surprise forays in neighbouring country. This was found to be the best way to keep up interest, a very real problem as scouting is most necessary when there are fewest larvae to find. needed the ingenuity of the flying squads to discover certain breeding places that had before been suspected. Squads of water searchers were formed to track down any little holes that had escaped. If a place needed cutting back, who found it signal system. A seaborne service was formed to reach parts of the main coast which were inaccessible by land. There was also a number of small islands lying off the coast which had to be treated at the same time. Fulicine larvae, like these, were regarded as a check on the effectiveness of the lava siding against Anopheles. If the one survived, the other might. As the autumn of 1948 approached, wherever larvae were found in a breeding place, lava siders were concentrated at the danger spot 
an intensive scouting was carried out inside a radius of three kilometers. All possible shelters for adults within the area were searched. Before the end of the 1948 breeding season, of all the breeding places on the island, 99.936% were negative for Anopheles labranchi, 99.79% negative for Algeriensis, and 99.77% negative for Claviger. Even if complete eradication of labranchi is obtained before Alice leaves Sardinia, this will not mean the end of precautions. Sardinia is an island, but it can still be invaded by Labranchi brought by ships or aeroplanes. A quarantine service must be maintained as long as there is danger of the reintroduction of a malarial vector. Sardinia, with its barriers of sea and the problems of its difficult terrain, poses the question, not yet answered, whether it is possible to eradicate abundant indigenous mosquitoes from an area of some thousands of square miles. Meanwhile, certain other questions can profitably be considered. Is it possible successfully to conduct such an enormous and complicated experiment as that in Sardinia on a relatively short time schedule? When such a program is undertaken, what scientific problems may be usefully studied with it? For example, what effects may follow extensive and repeated applications of insecticides over large areas? And finally, if an island can be cleared and quarantined, is it practicable to apply similar techniques to rid a continental area? Can it be done? Would it be worth the cost? The Sardinian project has tremendous world significance. But what will it mean for Sardinia if Anopheles are eradicated? Work has already started again on the Flumendoza Dam. Begun in 1936, it was abandoned because so many workers were infected with malaria. Over 10,000 cases of primary malaria were reported in the island in 1946. No cases were reported in the first half of 1949. Human energy is being built up for reconstruction. The vicious cycle has been broken. With the shadow of malaria lifted from them, the people can begin to build up again the wealth of their island.